Okay, good morning everybody. We're ready to start. QFT 2 and then a standard model. Thank you. Good morning everybody. You can hear me good? Oh, no, it's, uh, all I need to do is do it a little up. I hope everybody's awake. I know it's this 9 a.m. thing. Um, <clears throat> at Cornell at least, I had people literally fall asleep in my class. I don't know what to do. I, 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 make, I try my best jokes and they were like sleeping, like totally sleeping. So I hope that you are awake <laughs> and because we have a lot of fun going on today. So we are going to continue where we started yesterday. And before I go on, let me say that uh, for the, um, uh, whatever it's called, the uh, question, session in the afternoon, I prepared the question. So there's some question I was kind of running on you yesterday and I summarize them in a file, and there's some more questions that we're going to have today, and it's going to be in a file, and I'm going to send the file to people, and they're going to post it. So then by, when you have, start having the session, you can download it and start looking at the question. And definitely, I will be around, so if you have some question about the questions, I'm here to answer about the answer. Okay, so, <laughs> so yesterday we were starting to talk kind of a brief, very brief, Handwave introduction to quantum field theory. And the way I like to think about it is as following. It's a little bit abstract, but the idea is as following. So the, it's, the way I like to think about field theory is just a generalization of classical mechanics. In classical mechanics, the question that we ask is that we have a position of a particle. And the only problem we think about a position of a particle is that it's, very, it's something that we are very used to. Okay, so it's not abstract enough. But the thing about the position of a particle is also somewhat something abstract, and then life would be much simpler. So in mechanics, you say, oh, I have a position of a particle, and there's only one time. And in field theory, I ask what is the value of a field in four-dimensional time, okay, which is called T mu. Okay? So that's basically the, the bigger step, the bigger abstraction that we take. Instead of thinking about part, a position as a function of one time, we think about the value of something as a function of four variables, which we call uh, x mu or t mu. And then we take the Lagrangian, instead of x and x dot, it's become phi and d mu phi, and the action instead of integral over one phi time, it's integral over four times or four x mu. And <coughs> then, just with a little bit of abstraction, we just say, oh, everything we know for classical mechanics, we can just take over and we understand. And the next step we did is we always expand around the minimum, and we just say, just like in classical mechanics, in quantum field theory, in, in field theory is the same story. We expand around the minimum, and when we expand around the minimum, everything is harmonic oscillator, and then we kind of identify what is a particle, and we say, oh, a particle, which is <coughs> something that we kind of have some intuition what it is, it's become more abstract and said, oh, a particle is just an excitation of a field. And it's a little bit more abstract, but it's okay, that's what we are, you know, when we do physics. And abstraction in physics is just about getting used to it, okay? So after doing quantum mechanics for so many years, and I was teaching classical mechanics, it looks so weird to me. For example, that, you know, when you have, like, some matter here, and a particle going around, and it doesn't fill the whole space, all those kind of things. Or, for example, when you get used to 
uh, relativistics notation and you start something in non-relativistic, it's something very weird. It's just because we get used to it. So all this idea that a particle is just an excitation of something, it's something that we hopefully will get used to it. And what we ended last time, we asked the question, what's happened with higher order term? And then all of you said, oh, we have to use perturbation theory. So that's where we're going to start today. So let's start with perturbation theory. And the very basic idea of perturbation theory is as following. So let's consider that we have some Hamiltonian H, and we write the Hamiltonian as H0 plus H1, where H1 is much, much smaller than H0. And already here, it's a little bit surprising. What do I mean by this? Because what is H? Well, H is an operator, right? So what do I mean by an operator is much smaller than another operator? I know something is small when I said, oh, five is much, much smaller than a million. That makes sense to me, OK? The size of the Earth is much smaller than the size of the galaxy. That makes sense to me. But what does it mean that I say H1 is much, much smaller than H0? Hmm? Is the eigenvalue of H0 are much smaller than the eigenvalue of H1? Is that the correct description? Yes? The coupling is small. That's what we actually, at the end of the day, have, that we have some number that appear there that is small. But again, it's not very well defined. So we have to be kind of careful what we really mean. And what we really mean by the eigenvalues, usually we mean that the eigenvalue of H, of total H, minus the eigenvalue of H0, is much smaller than the eigenvalue of H0. OK, that's what we really mean kind of formally. OK, but we have to remember that, that but we kind of have the intuition, the intuition that we have something very small and we want to see what is the effect of this something that is very small. OK, and in many ways, perturbation theory, and that's usually the way we learn perturbation theory, we say perturbation theory is just a mathematical tool to actually use seeing that we cannot really solve. So if I don't know how to solve the full Hamiltonian, I use perturbation theory. And if I could solve the, the full Hamiltonian, I never care about perturbation theory. Okay, that's kind of the image that we have. Perturbation theory is just a mathematical tool. Okay, but when we do particle physics, perturbation theory in a way, the way I like to think about it, is much more than a mathematical tool. It's really something that really helps us to describe the, the way we see the world. Okay, and let me discuss it in the following sense. So in many times, we really like to work with the eigenvalue of H of the total Hamiltonian. Why? Why would we like to kind of choose a basis where the eigenvalues of the full Hamiltonian is our basis? What is special about the basis of the eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian? Hmm? So everything is physical, so I can, it's a basis choice, right? So in what way, you are, you, are, you are correct, I just want you to be a little more precise. In what way it's really referred to physical states? Hmm? It is a, a steady state. The eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian are the state that propagate in time without nothing, okay? And another way that I like to talk about it is that if you're in an eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian, you are very boring. Okay, so you know, you, if you have some friend of you that is very boring, you say, ah, he's an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. Nothing happened, right? An eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, there's just a phase and nothing really happened. If you want to have some action in your life, you better not be an eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian, right? Because only then you have some dynamics, okay? So actually working the eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian is very, very nice if you just want to understand how a system in a steady state. When nothing happened, then it's very, very nice to work in the eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian. However, when you actually think about dynamics, in order to have dynamics, you must be in a non-eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. Okay? And if we do particle physics, and in particle physics we actually really look after the dynamics, and we like to ask the question, if I have a muon, and the muon decay into an electron, the muon that I measure better not be an eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian. Is that clear? If the muon were a true eigenvalue of the true Hamiltonian, this muon would never decay and would never interact. Yes? So the muon that we all know and love, and the one that we keep hitting us from the sky all the time, these muons are not eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian. They are eigenvalue of H0. They are the eigenvalue of the approximate Hamiltonian. And the reason that the muon decay is that because it's not a true eigenvalue of the true Hamiltonian, it's only a very close <coughs> to the full one, and it's the H1, it's the perturbation that makes the, the muon decay, okay? So the way we like to think about uh, in particle physics, we think about our particles, our particles are excitations 
of the H0. They are not the excitation of the full Hamiltonian, they are the excitation of the H0, and the decays are what happen because we have perturbation. Okay, so the way I like to think about it when we think about particle physics, perturbation theory is a little more than just a mathematical tool. It's actually something that brings us into an, a better understanding of what's going on in the physics. Okay, <clears throat> so let me talk about uh, perturbation theory for two harmonic oscillators. And I took the following uh, potential. I have two, two oscillators, X and Y, and I have some coupling between them alpha. And you see that alpha is x cubed y, so it's a, dimension, it's a dimension three. These two are dimension two, x squared and y squared, and this is dimension three. And we assume that alpha is small, and what's happened uh, classically? Classically, alpha move energy between the two modes. And you remember we saw this uh, 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 couple the uh, swings yesterday. So how it moves the energy between one mode to another? When alpha is bigger, the energy flow is, <coughs> is stronger, right? So now I'm asking you the following question. What's really happening in quantum mechanics? So in classical mechanics, we cannot have the following intuition. If I have two pendula that are pendula, pendulous, Pen uh, two, two of those, two of, two, two of, yes. If I have two of, those, of them and <coughs> there's <coughs> no coupling at all and I say I only give energy to this one, this one will never move. Now I put a little coupling between them, then some energy from this one start moving to the other one, okay? And the bigger the coupling is, the energy flow is stronger, okay? There's more within, if I say, oh, how much energy I have in the other pendulum, after one second, the bigger the coupling, I have more energy in the other one. Is that clear? Now I'm asking what's happening in quantum mechanics. How in quantum mechanics energy flow from one oscillator to the other? Do you see the question? So what is really the analog, the quantum analog of this energy transfer from one pendulum to another? from one spring to another. Yeah, so the interaction term is what's doing it. But what's really, what is the dynamic? So in, <coughs> in classical mechanics, we understand the dynamics. Again, this, this example that I gave you, I should, I should have bring the, the video, to, that you see the video. That you, know, you have one kid uh, on this swing, and then suddenly some energy go to the other kid on the other swing. And the time that it takes from, one, from the energy from one kid to go to the other depends on alpha. Okay, the bigger alpha is, quicker the energy flow. Yes, yes. But now I'm talking just about, just about harmonic oscillators. What's really going, so in, in, in quantum mechanics, what's happened when I make alpha large? What's really going on? How energy transfer in quantum mechanics? How, that's the, you know, something about how to do the calculation, and we're actually going to do it soon. But I'm asking the, Description. What is really happening in the description? Sorry? Interactional, yes. But how it's happening? What's really happening? Okay, so let me give you my best example of really what's going on. And the answer is as following. <coughs> so as you can see, there's two faucets here. Okay? I took it from the internet. And this one, there's a a constant flow of water, okay? That's the classical analog. In classical mechanics, there's a total flow of energy. And if you turn the faucet and you make it more, what's happened? You have a bigger flow, okay? So turning the faucet is like making alpha stronger. Now what's happened when you take a real physical faucet and you start faucet, right? And you start turning it off and off? Eventually, there's no more flow. What you start having, you start having this dripping, okay? One drip at a time. Yes? Okay? And you know how we call this dripping? It's a quanta of water. Every time there's one quanta of water. It's called a drop. Okay? So that's what's really happening in quantum mechanics. What's happening in quantum mechanics? That instead of having a constant flow of energy from one to another, the flow must be done in quantiles. Okay? That's why it's called quantum mechanics. Every time there's some energy move from one, uh, from one oscillator to another, it must go with one quanta. What is the quanta, by the way? H bar omega, right? So every time I move, the smallest energy that I can move is H bar omega, okay? And then I ask, how much is, what is the, okay? when I make alpha smaller and smaller, the probability of moving becomes smaller and smaller, okay? So if I say if alpha is some value, and then I say on average, one, 
I have one quantum move per second, then I make alpha smaller, then it will come one, one quantum move per 10 seconds, and then one quantum move per one hour. Is that clear? That's clear the difference? And you can do this experiment, okay? <coughs> Just take whatever, go back to your hotel, open a little bit, don't waste too much water, okay? And then small, and you start seeing the drop, okay? So by the way, this analog <coughs> is not totally correct. What is the, the thing that is not quantum in this analog of the faucet? Do you see the analog, right? What is not, not, not correct? What is not correct in the analog? In, oh, <laughs> that's true. But that has to do with, uh, with statistical mechanics. So the thing that is not really correct here, that in quantum mechanics, we don't know when the next drop is going to happen. In the faucet, you're going to see it's like ta, 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 ta. But the quantum mechanics analog would be ta, 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 something like this. It's going to be uh, some uh, arbitrary. The only thing that we know is that the average going to be the same as this analog that we have here, OK? So we actually got the understanding what's happening in quantum mechanics. So when I take two, two oscillators and couple between them, there's energy flow from one, there could be energy flow from one to the other. And the way the energy flows, it's not like in a classical constant flow. There's some probability that this energy will flow from one to another. And when the energy flow, it flow in a quanta. We OK? We all understand this? Good. So then, there's the famous Fermi Golden Rule. And as a cool trivia, who invented the Fermi Golden Rule? <laughs> Come on. I know it's too early. OK. Who invented the Fermi Golden Rule? <laughs> so the obvious answer would be Fermi. Why? Because if it's called the Fermi Golden Rule, you would think that Fermi invented the Fermi Golden Rule, right? That's usually the case. However, it was not Fermi. Anybody know who invented the Fermi? Who? Anybody? Dirac, very nice. So why it is called the Fermi Golden Rule and not the Dirac Golden Rule? Because Fermi went out and tell everybody, look this amazing work of Dirac. He did so much. This is the Dirac thing, and everybody call it the Fermi Golden Rule. <laughs> <laughs> it's a true story. For apparently, Dirac was a very, very quiet person, and Fermi was the total opposite. He was a very talkative person. So what Dirac was saying, and Fermi make everybody know about it, is that the probability, so we ask, what is the probability that this one quantum move from one oscillator to the other? In order to calculate this probability, we have to calculate what we call the transition amplitude. The transition amplitude is the f and i are the eigenvalue of h0, so the final state and the initial state, and I put in the middle the perturbation. So I put the perturbation in the middle, and then I calculate the the transition amplitude, and the probability, which is just a number, or I said, okay, it's, a, it's, not, it's not a number, it's a <coughs> how much time it takes between transition on average, it's proportional to the amplitude squared time phase space, okay? And phase space is just the density of states that we have. So this Fermi Golden Rule, which I assume all of you have seen before and you studied before, it's our starting point. It's our starting point to do all calculations. All the calculation has to do with this. So I have to calculate the transition amplitude, then I have to square it, and then I add up all the states, and I know what is the probability to have the transition from one harmonic oscillator into another harmonic oscillator. Good. <coughs> Oops. So <coughs> let's talk about first order and second order perturbation theory. And again, I assume you all seen it before. So when I have first-order perturbation theory, basically, I just put my uh, <coughs> perturbation between the final and the initial state. That's the transition amplitude. Now, uh, the initial and final state must have the same energy, so I can actually have a transition. So it's a little bit different than what you used to. So when you do perturbation theory, most of the study in quantum mechanics, you calculate correction to the spectrum. Okay? And then you just have the same state, or if you have the generated state, you look in some subspace of the, of the generated state. What we are doing here is we calculate transition amplitudes, which is very similar to calculating correction to the energy, but it's not really the same. So I have two states that are different, I and F, but they do have the same energy. So I can have transition from one oscillator to the, to the other because they have the same energy. And this is first order perturbation theory. In first order perturbation theory, all I care about is just the state that are involved. I don't care about the rest of the spectrum. 
So if I ask two states that have an energy three, I don't care about the state that have, have an energy nine. Okay, it's only the state that have the same energy. What happened in second order perturbation theory? In second order perturbation theory, the transition is actually going in the following famous formula, that I have the, my initial state i coupled to some intermediate state n, and then this intermediate state n coupled to my final state f. And I have to sum over all the intermediate state n. And I sum them, but then I pay a, <coughs> a price by the, the, by the denominator. And the denominator tells me the following things, is that when n is farther away from my initial and in the energy of the initial and final state, the contribution of these states is less important, okay? So the way we think about second order perturbation theory is unlike first order perturbation theory that only care about my, the state that are with the same energy, second order perturbation theory cares about the whole spectrum. It's an amazing statement. It's the statement that quantum mechanics, at the end, everything is connected. So in second order perturbation theory, I actually, I know about the state of the theory that is far, far away. And the farther away they are, the contribution is smaller. And it's suppressed exactly by one over delta E, the, the energy difference from the state that I care about. OK? Good. <clears throat> so let's come back to and ask what's happened when we have transitions in second order perturbation theory for harmonic oscillators. OK? And you remember we talked so much about the creation and annihilation operators and why they are important, and I said they are important for perturbation theory. Now it's where they become important. So I have the following thing. I have my perturbation. And I'm asking you the following question. If I have a given i, what if the amplitude is non-zero? OK, so this final state f, what is the one that this uh, transition matrix element is non-zero? Do you understand the question? So in general, I just say I have my initial state i, and this f could be anything. So there's actually infinite number of states here, OK? And amazingly enough, almost all of them, this amplitude is 0. Only very few, this amplitude is non-zero. So what I'm asking you is the following. Look in, I, I will be quiet for one minute, and I want you to talk like with your neighbors and make friends, and <coughs> ask the following thing. What are the f's that are not 0? Is the question clear? Not really. So if i, let's say i, I can say i is a 5 of x and 2 of y. OK, so I can think about some initial state i. Let's make it specific. So my initial state i is nx equals 5 and ny equals 2. Let's say ny equals 9. OK? That's i. Now I'm asking what is f such that this matrix element, such that uh, such that f x square y i is not equal to 0. So what I'm telling you is that there's only very few f's where this is non-zero. For almost all the f's, this one is 0. So let's take this very specific example, 5 and 9, and I want you to tell me what are the ones that are non-zero. OK? So for example, 20, 20 will be 0. Yes? If you have the answer, don't tell it, because I want everybody to. Are you, OK, so what I want to do is I want one minute to be quiet. Please talk to your neighbors and do it. Just write, and I want an answer which are the ones that are non-zero, OK? Please, please. I know it's early in the morning. You can do one, two, three, four, and then start writing, OK? <coughs> Please, please try to do it.
Okay, <coughs> so I hope some of you got uh, the answer. So can someone tell me what ifs are non-zero? Someone? Yes, you had it before. I, yes. And why have to be? And why can be either eight or ten? And then x. Five, seven, or three. Five, seven, or three. So let's do see, five and seven. Very nice. So that's the right answer. And <coughs> I hope many of you got this answer. So let me see how he got the answer. I don't know, but I assume that that's the way he got the answer. And you tell me if we had the telepathic idea, and I and I got you right. Okay. So <coughs> the way he was doing it, he said, oh. It's very easy. It was so easy, he just, you know, I, I didn't even start talking, I already had the answer. He just said, <coughs> uh, I can write my x. x is a, ax plus ax dagger, right? That's what x is. And what I have up there, I have, so let's start with y. Ah, y is simpler. y is ay plus ay dagger, right? So when, a, when y walk on my, uh, <coughs> initial state, what my y can do for the initial state. So if my initial state have ny equal 9, and I have y in the middle, what the y can do for my initial state? It can either make this 9 into an 8 by applying a, or it can make this 9 into a 10 by applying the ay. OK? And therefore, my final state, only if it's 8 or 10, will be non-zero. Because my, after I apply it, it becomes either 8 or 10. And then I have x squared, so x is this, so x squared go like ax squared plus, plus 2, kind of, 2a a dagger plus a dagger squared. So what the a does, a squared what it does, it reduces 2. a a dagger what it does, it do nothing, and a dagger squared increase it by 2, okay? So that's why we can either reduce by 2, stay the same, or increase by two, okay? So what we find, we find that out of the infinite possibilities of F, almost all of them, the matrix element vanish, and the only thing that doesn't vanish, that do not vanish, are only this uh, kind of uh, <coughs> thing, okay? So <coughs> that will be the, the case. Is it clear? And <coughs> can anybody quickly tell me what would be the situation if I have x squared y cubed? Someone else? What would it be if I have x squared and y, y cubed? What would happen? Yes, so the answer is for x, it will be the same, so it's either stay the same or plus minus 2. And for y, it's either be plus minus 1 or plus minus 3. I hope it's just clear. You just take your things do some, uh, <coughs> open, open it, and I just say how many A's and how many A's diggers I have, and I work on my, final, on my initial state with those, and I kind of bring them up and down, okay? So the big thing about this kind of perturbation theory of harmonic oscillators is the fact that why I have some matrix element in second order in particular, where I can have infinite number of states, many, many of them, almost all of them vanishes, and I have only few that are surviving, okay? Good. <coughs> so... <coughs> Let us then see how, using this, we can actually calculate transition amplitude. So let's say, let's consider the initial state to be 0, 1. So I have 1, y, and 0, and x. And my final state, I can do 2, 0. And just, I, I choose my case such that this is, have the same energy, OK? And then I put my perturbation, and I see that from 0, 1, I can go into 2, 0, OK? And <coughs> then what I found, I found that this amplitude I just plug it in, and there's some coefficient in front. But what I think about it is the following thing. I think about my perturbation, this alpha x squared y, and the following things. I start with one y, OK? And then this y in the perturbation annihilate the, the y particle, because I have one state of the y particle. And then the x squared, it creates two x particles. So I think about it. A transition from one quanta in the, y, in the y oscillator into two quanta in the x oscillators. But in other words, another way to say it is that I start with a y particle, and this y particle decay into two x particles. Okay? It are not really particles, they are just, just excitation of harmonic oscillators. But 
excitation of harmonic oscillators are just particles, so we can actually use the same language. Okay? And then we can actually calculate it, we square it, we do the phase space, and then we can calculate the lifetime of this state. So if I ask what is the lifetime of the state 1, 0, that's how I do the calculation, and I calculate the lifetime of the state y0. Okay? Good. <clears throat> so now let's do a little bit more complicated perturbation theory, and I have the following situation. I have three oscillators, x, y, and z, and I have the following perturbation, and I want to calculate y going to 3x using second-order perturbation theory. Yes? A question? No, sorry. It was above you, and then you. Yes? Sorry? Yes. So there's also the... Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, when you have the kinetic terms, they are also squared, right? So you also have um, A and A dagger in there. But you normally would assume that they don't do anything, right? So yes. You so, don't yeah, yeah. So, so the, the answer is as following. I only care about the A and A dagger in terms that are not harmonics. And they, in the kinetic terms, they are harmonics. This is the P squared. And the P squared is always second order, right? So I also don't care about the, the kx squared. I don't care about them because they are quadratic, and they are the ones that give me the h0. All I care about is the h1. So the way we do perturbation theory is I have my h0, and my h0 I use to calculate my zeros order Hamiltonian, and my basis that I use is the basis of h0, and all I care about is the h1. So I only care about the h1, and in particular in the example that I use, my H1 is only potential term. I don't have perturbation to the kinetic term. Okay? There was the other, another question down there. If, how do you recover the continuous faucet drop from the discrete one? Can you have a limit like current states, but for interaction? Yeah, so the question is a general question, how we recover the classical limit in the, from the quantum things. And the answer is, like the usual answer. It's become classical when I actually go to the very, very high state. So when n goes to very, very large, so when, when say n is 10 to the 20, then the transition becomes so, so fast that you just think, and then usually also your initial state, it's not a true eigenvalue, okay? So that's the standard answer, and that's what we get here. And in particle physics, most of the time, we do not care about the classical limit, actually. Okay, so we'll get there. Okay. So let's do this. I have three, oscill three oscillators, x, y, and z. And I use this uh, h1. And using this h1, you can actually see that I cannot move from here to here. So there's no direct transition from this state to this state. By the way, what I should have had if I wanted to move from this to this, what term I should have had? Uh, I, should have, I should have write it explicitly. So <coughs> I have this state nx equal to 3, and my initial state is ny equal to y, okay? So I'm asking the following question. What kind of a direct interaction I could do in order to move? Ah, oh, this is like quite even worse. Let's do it like this. nx equal to 3, and ny equal to 1. What kind of a interaction I need to move from here to here? Yes? x cube y. x cube y, really good. Why x cube y? Because I want x cube to create three x's and the y to annihilate one y, okay? But as you see, I don't have it up there. And since I don't have it up there, I need to use second order perturbation theory, and I have to go through some intermediate state in order to calculate the transition amplitude, okay? What I'm just doing here is classic standard, standard, standard second order perturbation theory. And then I ask, what kind of intermediate state I have? So you can convince yourself, but I'm not going through the exercise, that there's actually two passes that I can go and I call them A1 and A2. So the first one, A1, I go from a state 0, 1, 0, and then I use this beta, and I use this beta such that this beta create one <coughs> x for me and create one z for me and annihilate one y. So it's create x, annihilate y, and create z. So I go to 1, 0, 1. And then I use the alpha term, and the alpha term create two x's and annihilate the z to get me into this. And I have another way where I first use the alpha, and the alpha create two x's and the z for me, and then I use the beta, and the beta kills the <coughs> y and z and annihilate an x. Do you see it? So I get two kind of amplitudes, and then the total amplitudes will be, in both cases I have alpha and beta, when I put those two things in, 
So both of them are alpha and beta, and I have some number over delta E1 and then some number over delta E2. Okay? So we know how to do it, and actually in the homework that I hope that you will do this afternoon, I will ask you to do it very carefully with all those numbers, some square root of six, square root of two, all those things, everything is known, and you will just, I will ask you to actually calculate it explicitly. So now I want to do a little bit uh, closer look into this, and <clears throat> let's see what come out. Okay. So the question, if you have any question, do you understand what I'm trying to do? The second order perturbation theory, and I just see there's only two terms from the infinite sum, only two terms are non-zero, okay? And I want to actually see what's going on with these two terms. Okay, so I have a chalk, and I want to do the following things. I want to look at the first amplitude. So the way I like to think about it is the following. I'm going to use as if this is like kind of time going forward. It's not really time, but I kind of start with my initial state, go into the intermediate state, and go to the final state. It's not really time, it's just as if, okay? It's quantum mechanics. So I start with my initial state, and my initial state, I can write it like this. There's some one line that is y, okay? And now what's happened when I insert my beta in? What's happened? Then this y disappear, and instead, two x's, one x and one z appear, right? So let's call this x, and let's call it z. And what's happened here? Here I did the alpha, sorry, the beta thing, right? You see what I mean? So this is my initial state. That's my intermediate state. So that's my intermediate state. And now what's happened after that? After that, I include the alpha. And the alpha kill the z. And instead of the z, I will have two x's coming in, right? So I put here an alpha. And then I have two x's coming in, right? And this x keep going, OK? So this is my initial state. That's my intermediate state. And that's my final state. Everybody is with me on this? Good. Does it remind you something? Yes. <laughs> Good. I don't want to say the word yet, but <coughs> it's just second. It's just second order perturbation theory for harmonic oscillators, right? There's nothing about particle physics yet at this point. Okay. So now let's do the other one. Let's do the other one. And the other one I start with y. And then what's happened, then I have my uh, alpha. And this alpha <coughs> is creating three particles, right? It's create um, <coughs> x, x, and the z, right? So this is my intermediate state. My intermediate state is y, z, x, x, yes? And then, and that's the, that's the alpha. Right? That's the alpha. And now I have my beta. And what the beta does for me in this case, it's take a y and a z and annihilate them and create an x instead of them. Right? So I have my x going on. OK? And that's my beta. Yes? You see? <coughs> so you see what I did here. It's just a graphical representation of second order perturbation theory of harmonic oscillators, yes? And <coughs> let me just plot those on the side. So one of them look like this, and the other one look like this. Yes? Okay? And can you see that those two diagrams I call them diagrams by now, OK? These two graphical description of second order perturbation theory of harmonic oscillator, they are basically topologically the same. You see that these two are the same. It's just the question what the direction of this line. So if this line go forward, I have this. And when this line go backward, I have this. You see? But topologically, they are the same diagram. They are both this. They both look like this diagram. OK? Yes? So they are not the same diagram. <laughs> but now they are the same. Thank you very much. I'm so, I'm so happy that one of you is awake in the morning. OK? <coughs> and not only this, also the labels are the same. This is y, this is x, this is z, x, x, y, z, x, x, x. Now they are the same. <laughs> now they are the same. <laughs> 
All I need to do is put the labels. Huh? Cool, isn't it? It's really cool. OK? So if I want to do second order perturbation theory, all I need to do is just write this one. And immediately when I write this, I said, oh, there's also this one. And I know that I have to take actually both of them and, <coughs> and put them together. OK? So, <coughs> and I'm not going to do the, the really most impressive fun I'm not going to do because I really want you to do it because it's going to be fun. So please try to do it this afternoon. I guarantee fun, okay, once you see the results. So what I ask you to do is the following. So you do second order perturbation theory. You never heard about Feynman, okay? And you just calculate this diagram and this diagram. They are the same. You know how to do them, and you add them up. And when you add them up, you find the following amazing result. You find that when you add them up, the denominator, the denominator that you had in the beginning, so in, the, in, in second order perturbation theory, you have E i minus E n, E intermediate. Okay, you have this one. And then you add these two amplitudes. You have the two amplitudes. And when you add the two amplitudes, what you find is that this one becomes 1 over <coughs> the energy of the initial state squared minus something that I called Q squared. And what is Q squared? Q squared is the energy flow inside the z-line, OK? And the energy flow inside the z-line in this kind of a case, if I start here with some energy y, and here I have energy x, the energy flow inside the z-line is the energy difference between the y and the x, OK? And as I, I mean, you all know what I'm going through, right? You've seen it before. But I don't want you, in, in, imagine you've never seen it before. All I want you to do is to do second order perturbation theory and find this as an output, that this is what you actually have. is E squared minus the energy flow that you have in the, in the thing, okay? And now, of course, the question, where have you seen it before? Where have you seen it before? This is, this is? Ah, please, please. This was the whole thing. I was working on it the whole night yesterday for this one point of the lecture. Yes, thank you very much. That's just the Feynman propagator that we have. And if you ever ask yourself why Feynman propagator have E squared and second order perturbation theory is only linear in, uh, in energy and Feynman propagator have second order perturbation is quadratic, that's the answer. That in, you really have to add the two amplitude in second order perturbation theory to get one Feynman propagator, OK? So <clears throat> and in, in the homework today, if you have time, I have another example that, you want, that I would ask you to do, which is this. I don't know if you have time. So you do this. There's six intermediate states. You add all six of them, and you see that all six of them are correspond to this one diagram. And then you add all six of them, and it's all given by one thing that's go. There's two of them. There's two intermediate, this and this. And you actually, instead of doing, adding six diagrams in second order perturbation theory, you have only one diagram in terms of this uh, Feynman thing. OK? <clears throat> so <laughs> let me kind of uh, sum up what we, we did so far. So we actually tried to ask the following question, how we actually have transition of simple harmonic oscillators. And the answer is as following. We, let, we take our uh, H0. Let's give my, my initial and final state in the, uh, <coughs> And then all the terms that have x to the n, x, something is a, is a vertex. It's giving me a vertex in my theory, a vertex like this. And then all I need to do is to actually start from my in into my out and write all the possible ways. In this case, there's only one possible path, which is this path. OK? And then I just say the amplitude is the product of the vertices. Each vertex is just. The, the term that I have in my uh, perturbation. And then each of these lines is just this uh, propagator that we call, which is basically just come from, is the denominator of second order perturbation theory. OK? There's a few more rules. And in the homework that I'm going to give you, I write them very explicitly. They are somewhat simpler than what we know in quantum field theory. But you just do them. And you can actually prove that that's what it is. So then we add the amplitude, square them, and we get the answer. OK? So what I was actually doing is that I was actually going through second order perturbation theory in, for harmonic oscillators. And we find very interesting something that looks like Feynman diagrams, something that looks like what we know in quantum field theory. And of course, this is not an accident. It is actually why Feynman diagrams are 
Well, we know because fields are just harmonic oscillators. The only thing is that here they are somewhat simpler because they are simple harmonic oscillators, and you never had to worry about things like fields and Lorentz invariance and all those kind of things that you kind of make the, the topic of quantum field theory a little heavy mathematically. Here, it's straightforward undergrad quantum mechanics. You just do it, and you find what we are. Any questions? Yes. Oh, so the question is, how do we actually know it? And <coughs> the answer is that <coughs> um, I don't have the formal proof for you. The only formal proof that I have is just basically taking uh, what Feynman did and just said, oh, I can do it in one dimension rather than in four dimension, okay? But actually, I'm sure that there's actually a proof that you can actually do in quantum mechanics without actually going through quantum field theory. All I did is just do it in this case, and I did it in this case. And you just see, wow, that's happened. But I'm sure, and, and, and the reason that I'm sure about it is because what, when we do Feynman integrals in four dimension, I don't care about the number of dimensions, so it should also work here, okay? And that's really this kind of, uh, but you can just check it. And if you have a, a, a cool proof, I would love to see it, okay? And I'm sure people, you know, you can think about it. And if you have a proof that this is actually the general thing, as I said, I didn't, I didn't prove it. I just, you know, I know it, but it will be really nice. Any more questions? <coughs> okay, so let's move into our, uh, a little more complicated thing with Feynman diagrams. So, Basically, it's the same story. There's nothing, when we move from what I was just doing, second order perturbation theory for harmonic oscillator into quantum field theory, it's the same. For a single harmonic oscillator, x is just a plus a dagger. When I have many of them, then for each degree of freedom is a plus a dagger. And if I have infinite number, then the, the i becomes a, a function, so I have a of k. So a of k is just the ai's of the discrete case. And that's how we write a quantum field. A quantum field is just the integral of the A's and the A dagger, which is just the simple real generalization of a single harmonic oscillator. Okay, you just have to do integral because I have many harmonic oscillators, okay? And then you do perturbation theory, it's exactly the same. What is omega? Omega is the frequency or the energy. So the energy is the time. And when I move from one time into four times, I have to move from energy into what we call P mu. We should have called it e mu, but we call it p mu for the same reason as we call it x mu. You see that this is what's going on? Instead of the energy, I have p mu. And instead of the energy squared, I have the mass squared, because p mu squared is just the mass. So when we have, in this kind of situation, the thing that flow in the line is the energy squared minus q squared. And when I move to uh, four times, then what is this energy squared? This energy squared is just m squared because it becomes p squared. So I have m squared minus q squared, okay? So you just see how Feynman diagram is just a very straightforward generalization of simple harmonic oscillator perturbation theory, okay? <coughs> so here is how we do calculation in Feynman diagrams. And I assume many of you did it before and you took some, some of you never actually done quantum field theory, and you never actually did calculation with Feynman diagrams, but it's a well-defined procedure of how to do it, and this well-defined procedure is just a generalization of the simple harmonic oscillator that we just did, okay? And we, usually we care only about 1 to n or 2 to n processes. Why do we, we usually don't care about like three initial states? Or four initial states, yeah? Experimentally, it's hard to set up. Yeah, I think that's a really good answer, yes. I mean, the probability to actually make those kind of collide is very, very small. And actually, Matt yesterday talked about how small is the probability of just to make two proton collide. So imagine that you have to put a, three, a third proton coming in. So it's very rare that we do care about. But sometimes we do care about it. And sometimes when we have a very high density, we do care about it, but usually we don't. And we just have to make sure that we have energy conservation. And energy conservation in, in particle physics is a little simpler than in harmonic oscillators because we have p mu, which is a variable. And then we distinguish between two kinds of particles, particles that I call on-shell and off-shell. And again, it's just a little bit of abstraction of what we started before. What is an on-shell particle? An on-shell particle is something that is on the external line. It's, some, it's a particle that satisfies p squared equal to m squared. And this initial line, and this initial line you see how we kind of gave it a life. 
In second order perturbation theory, just some intermediate state. That's what it is in second order perturbation theory. And when we move to a quantum field theory, we call this intermediate state an off-shell particle. And we kind of see it from this picture of the Feynman diagram. This is, looks like a particle that actually go and kind of transfer in, in, in time, but it's not really there. It's intermediate. It's only there quantum mechanically. It's not really there. So something that is not really there and it's only there quantum mechanically, we call off-shell particle. Off-shell particle is a particle that E squared is not equal to P squared plus M squared. It's just that off-shell particle, okay? It's just the intermediate state of second order perturbation theory, okay? And then what we do, we write the transition amplitude, which is just the product of all the vertices times this uh, one over the energy for second order perturbation theory. We add them up, we square them, we do the phase phase integral, and we get the things right now, okay? So I'm not going to get into all the details, and if you ever done it, you know there's a lot of, of details, and there's so many details that now you put it on a computer, and the computer does all the details for you. I mean, during the course, you don't do it on the computer, but after the course, you never do it yourself anymore, right? Because it's an algorithm, so you know how to do it. But the physics is this. The physics is just the physics of second order perturbation theory. So let's do some examples. <coughs> and let's take, now I move from just simple harmonic oscillator into a <coughs> quantum field theory, and I'm asking you the following things is this is the Lagrangian, and I'm looking for z going to x, y, okay? And I ask what is the energy conservation condition and what is the diagram and estimate the amplitude. So z going to x, y can come from this term, you see? I annihilate z and create an x, y. And what is the energy conservation condition? So when a z can decay into an x, y? When the mass of z is larger than the mass of x and y. So what we have is the following thing. I need that mz is larger than mx plus my, and this is the diagram. It's a very simple diagram, okay? And the amplitude is just lambda one, okay? So that's what we do in Feynman diagrams, and we know what the rate. So what would the rate would be? The rate would be proportional to lambda one squared. And here's another example, y going to three x's, and here I don't have a direct term that does it for me. It's just this example that we just have here, and you see that this one, looks extremely like this one, very, very similar. What is the difference here? I have alpha and beta, and here I have lambda one and lambda two. But otherwise, it's the same, and I calculate the diagram, and the diagram are proportional to these two vertices, lambda one and lambda two, and time this intermediate state that's come from second order perturbation theory. Any question on this? I know most of you have seen it before, and it's kind of easy, and if you've never seen it, I really want you to do it. So it's really kind of, and for your homework, I ask you to do this kind of diagram and estimate it, okay? <coughs> okay, so let me kind of summarize these little parts of what we did. We kind of learned uh, Feynman diagrams. And the idea of Feynman diagrams is the following, that uh, <coughs> it's really the generalization of second order perturbation theory for harmonic oscillators. And the way we think about it is following. We have our zeroth order Lagrangian or zeroth order Hamiltonian. And the quadratic term describes free fields. Free fields, as we say, they are boring, nothing happened to them. They don't interact, they don't decay. And we use perturbation theory to look for this higher order term. Higher order terms are what we call interaction. And those interaction terms create and annihilate particles. And they also create and annihilate off-shell particles. And these off-shell particles uh, give me the tool, which is just perturbation theory. So it's really, really just perturbation theory to do this calculation, okay? So I want to emphasize the Feynman diagrams is nothing but perturbation theory that we know. Perturbation theory for harmonic oscillators, when we make them into quantum field theory, become Feynman diagrams, okay? Feynman diagrams, we have to remember, they are perturbation theory. It's extremely important, because when perturbation theory is not valid, we cannot use Feynman diagram, okay? It's, it's obvious when I say it like this, right? And we, when QCD becomes strong, for example, we cannot use Feynman diagram. And some people do plot Feynman diagrams on QCD, and they always say, but it's only a plot. It's not really what it is, because we cannot use perturbation theory, OK? Any question on all this little thing of Feynman diagram? Yes? Sorry, can we think about a group? 
Can you think about loop diagram in terms of perturbation theory? Uh, yes, of course, you know, at the end we have to go to loop diagram. And in purpose, I didn't go into loop, into loop because in, in simple harmonic oscillators, loops are actually never there, okay? You only get loop when you have more than one time dimension, okay? But then I, I definitely didn't go to the full, full thing of Feynman diagrams. Basically, all I wanted to get from this feeling, from this, is that Feynman diagrams are just a generalization of second order of perturbation theory for harmonic oscillators. And there's a little more details that you, know, you really need to do when you do in the quantum field theory. But the basic idea is the same. You don't need any quantum field theory in order to understand what Feynman diagrams are. Any more questions? OK, so let's move on. And we want to move on to this amazing topic of symmetries. And <clears throat> symmetries, as we know, are very important in physics. And you are not surprised by this statement. But it's never a bad idea to say it again. Symmetries are very important in physics. And since they are so important in physics, we actually have to do a, a little bit more formal explanation of symmetries. And once we really understand how we actually use symmetries in physics, we have to understand how we use symmetries when we extract, when we do particle physics and when we do uh, the standard model. So let's come back to the very beginning of uh, what I was telling you yesterday. And the question is, how do we build Lagrangian? And it's a little bit weird to say we built Lagrangian, OK? But this is the idea of how we actually come with Lagrangian that can describe nature. So the idea is as following. We assume <coughs> what we call uh, is the democratic principle. So what is, uh, at least ideally, the definition of democracy? The definition of democracy, well, there's many definitions. But one definition is that in democracy, everything is allowed unless it's explicitly forbidden. That's why the government put these huge books of what is forbidden, right? Because everything else is allowed, and they want to make sure that they don't forget anything. But in democracy, everything is allowed unless it is forbidden, which is the opposite of the totalitarian picture. The totalitarian picture tells you that everything is forbidden unless this is allowed. And therefore, in a totalitarian regime, the books are very small, right? <laughs> There's not much that is allowed. But the idea is that in physics, we use the democratic principle. That means everything is allowed unless it is forbidden. And how in physics we forbid things? By a symmetry. We just say it violates a symmetry, therefore it's forbidden. OK? So I said everything is allowed, and I put the symmetry on, and I said everything is allowed unless it's forbid by this symmetry. OK? So that's the first thing that we do. We write the most general one, and then we do the thing that we all really love to do, and that's expansion, OK? We start writing it in terms of x squared, x cubed, x to the 4, x to the 5, or in quantum field theory, let's call it phi squared, phi cubed, phi to the 4. And then we truncate at some point. Why we truncate? Why do we truncate? We talked about it. Why do we truncate? Why we don't keep going forever? Ah, that's actually the quantum field theory answer, you know, measurability. But actually, I don't, I, I want to actually talk about it in a second. We truncate because we do perturbation theory. And in perturbation theory, you have to truncate. That's the whole point. Why? Because physics is the art of approximation, right? So we have to truncate at some point. And how do we decide where we truncate? That's a general question in physics. How do we decide where we truncate? That's actually, it's a really... Thank you. I was, I was sure that now we're going to a two-minute discussion, and you immediately got the, exactly the right answer. Experiment. The only thing that tells us where to, ex to, to stop is experiment. If you have an experimental precision of 1%, and your first order term gives you 10 to the minus 5, you don't need to expand more. If your first order term gives you 20%, and second order gives you 5%, and only fifth term gives you 1%, you want to go to fifth term. OK? So the order that you want to keep expanding depends on how precise is your experiment. It's always this answer. It's how precise is your experiment. Yes? It is non renormalizable. So let me talk about renormal. Yes. So, so the question is as following. The question, what's happened when we go into non renormalizable term? So let me first even talk about it. Because as you say, I didn't even mention renormalizability. And already two of you kind of got me there, and I was trying to avoid, but now I cannot avoid it anymore. So one thing about quantum field theory is the following statement. is that if I go above dimension 4, the theory is not renormalizable. What does it mean that the theory is not renormalizable? That means that the theory cannot be the full theory. It can only be an effective theory. 
Is it a big deal? No. What's the big deal? It's all the theories are effective, so, so that's it. Okay, Newtonian mechanics. Do we ever worry about Newtonian mechanics when you do mechanics? That the fact that Newtonian mechanics is only an effective theory and at high velocity? No, all we are saying is that I do Newtonian mechanics when I can, when the velocities are small. I do Newtonian mechanics. Do I worry about classical mechanics when I do classical mechanics? And I say, no, it's really quantum. No, I'm not. I only care about it when I say, because now I can use class. You know what happened when I, well, if, I store, if I drop it, what would happen? That's a classical calculation. Do I worry about quantum effects? No, I don't. Why? Because it's in the classical regime. So in, it's a good enough approximation, right? So the point of renormalizability is the point is, do I ever care that my theory is an effective theory? And the answer is the following. If I care, then the theory is not good, and I have to actually do something else. I use the theory only when I don't care about the deep, deep UV, okay? And then I don't care about renormalizability, okay? And of course, I was a little like, you know, renormalizability is a very important issue, but when you do phenomenology, you usually don't care about renormalizability, okay? I think it's very, very important. All I care about is the fact that I know and appreciate and acknowledge the fact that my theory is not the full theory of nature. It's an effective theory. And once I acknowledge this fact, then I don't care about renormalizability, okay? It's like when I do classical mechanics, I don't care about quantum mechanics as long as I'm in the classical regime. So we usually expand and truncate, and we usually truncate at dimension four. Why four? Because four is renormalizable. <laughs> I just tell you, I don't care about it. But <laughs> so historically, we really care, and it just happened to be that in almost all cases, except neutrino masses, which we may touch at the end, and Andre probably will talk about it in great details um, <clears throat> when he will start doing his uh, neutrino lectures. Usually, dimension four is all what we need because experiments tell us that it's precise enough. Okay? And it just happened to be the dimension four, which is precise enough. It's also where we normalizability come in. Okay? And as I said, now neutrino mass gives us dimension five. Okay? So that's how we build a Lagrangian. We write the most general one that we can, and we truncate usually at dimension four. Okay? And what are the inputs? The inputs for writing a Lagrangian is what are the symmetries we impose. We impose a symmetry in order to forbid some terms. And what are the degrees of freedom? I have to say, oh, I have some system with five degrees of freedom, with 10 degrees of freedom. And in classical mechanics, the degrees of freedom are just the number of particles. In quantum field theory, the degree of freedom are just the number of fields. My, my building blocks are fields. In classical mechanics, my building blocks are particles, and the position of the particles. In quantum field theory, my building blocks are fields. Okay? And then I have to tell you how they transform under the symmetry. And I'm going to discuss it in some detail. And what is the output? The output is a Lagrangian with some finite number of parameters. Why is there a finite number of parameters? Because I truncate. If I didn't truncate, the number of parameters were infinite, and there was no, and we couldn't do physics. Because I truncate, the number of parameters is finite, and then what I need to do, I need to measure those parameters, and after I measure those parameters, I can make prediction. And I like to make this very clear, that a theory, a Lagrangian that I have, doesn't make any prediction. What makes prediction is that I make some measurements, those measurements me measure the parameters, and only then I can make prediction, okay? For example, there's a very famous prediction of Newtonian gravity, is the fact that all particles travel with the same speed, right? So I don't care if I take two, two things and I drop them, they should drop at the same velocity, okay? And you see, in order to really do it, I have to do two experiments. I cannot do just one. I have to do one to kind of measure G, and then the other one I can have a prediction, okay? Because I have one parameter in this theory. So in general, when I have a theory with 18 parameters, why I choose 18? Because many times you choose 18, because the standard model has 18, okay? If I have a theory with 18 parameters, I have to make 18 measurements, and then from the 19 measurement on, I can make prediction and I can test my theory. Okay? So this is a very important, this is kind of a semi-philosophical, but that's how we actually do physics. That's the algorithm to do physics. So if you have any question on this, I'll be happy to discuss. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so in principle, if I go to higher order terms, 
If I include dimension 5, say, 10, I have more parameters. If I have more parameters, I need more measurements, and then I can start making more and more precise uh, calculations, okay? So basically, the, the algorithm is the same. I go to some, up to some uh, order, truncate this order, make the number of measurements that I need in order to measure all the parameters, and then I can start making, a, a <coughs> then I start testing my theory. And if I don't expand to high enough order, then many times my theory breaks down. I say the, the experiment doesn't really give me what the theory predicts, so I have to go to higher order, and then I can actually see what the theory does. Yeah, 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 yeah. So of course, of course, of course, the first thing you're going to do is you actually start calculating high and higher order perturbation theory using simple harmonic oscillator and Feynman diagram, et cetera, et cetera. And only then you say, well, it's really not that, and I know that I need to actually add extra terms. And we're going to discuss it with the one example of neutrino mass we're going to get there. Okay, so let me talk now about what I call representation and symmetries. And I know some of you study Lie groups and Lie algebras and all this, and this is going to be known for you, but for some of you, I assume, you kind of know, don't know really Lie algebra, so I want to get you the very basics of Lie groups of Lie algebra using this idea. So what is a representation and <coughs> how we actually deal with it? So let's think about three-dimension classical mechanics, real space, and we have something that may uh, <coughs> rotate in real space. So I want my Lagrangian to be invariant under rotation in real space, okay? That's a requirement. I impose rotational symmetry on my classical Lagrangian, okay? That means that when I rotate my, my system, nothing happened to my Lagrangian. That's the meaning of a symmetry, okay? And now I look at my degrees of freedom, and let's say that my degrees of freedom is some uh, particle, and this particle, the position of the particle is a vector. What does it mean that it's a vector in real space? That means that when I rotate the space, the components rotate between themselves, right? So if I have a vector that is in the z direction, right, the vector in the z direction, one second, a vector in the z direction is this. That's a vector in the z direction. And now let's say that I take my system and rotate it into the x direction. After I rotate it by 90 degrees into the x direction, this vector becomes 1, 0, 0, right? So in, in one reference frame, it's, one, it's 0, 0, 1, and in another reference frame, it's 1, 0, 0. So this vector is not invariant under rotation, obviously, right? But there's something that is in, still invariant under rotation. What is invariant under rotation when I rotate a vector? The length of the vector, right? Because what is the length of this vector is 1, and what is the length of this vector is 1. So <laughs> we understand that vectors transform. They are not invariant under rotation. We say they transform as a vector, kind of an obvious thing, OK? <laughs> but <laughs> it's a little deeper. And the length of the vector is invariant. We say the length of the vector is a scalar. It's a scalar because it doesn't change under rotation. And the word scalar that we use for scalar field theory has to do with the transformation properties in four-dimensional Minkowski. But the word scalar in general means it doesn't change under rotation. So vector do change under rotation, and a scalar doesn't change under rotation, okay? And actually, if I have several vectors, I can actually build many things that are invariant, many scalars. So how do I build this scalar? So if I have this vector that I call Ri, this is Let's say this is Ri. What will be this? This will be Ri, Ri. That will be the dot product of the vector with itself. That's the length squared of the vector. The length squared of the vector, it's invariant, OK? And a way to see it is just look for the number of indices. So here I have one free index, and a free index tells me that something is rotate. Here I sum the two indices, OK? Actually, maybe. People that's the summation convention. You can also write it like this. With sum of i go from 1 to 3. Okay, this is the same. But here I do not have a free index. Ri, Ri, so since I do not have a free index, I know that this is invariant under rotation. Okay? So the, the point that I want to make is as following. Is no matter what kind of a system you have, your building blocks are things that do change when I rotate. But I can combine them 
into combination that do not change when I rotate. Is that point clear? And in vectors, I hope it's very clear. I take a vector, and vectors change when I rotate. And when I take a dot product of two vectors, the dot product is invariant under rotation. Yes? And when I say I require that my Lagrangian would be invariant under rotation, that means that my Lagrangian can only be a function of those, those dot products. OK? So those, those products are invariant. And, and oh, this is really bad notations. This is really not good. I should really change this transparency. It's really confusing. What I just mean is that I take two vectors, I dot product them, they don't have a free index. And then I, my Lagrangian have to be a function of only all those dot products. Good. <clears throat> so <clears throat> let's regeneralize this. And that was the example in three-dimensional real space. But fields work in some arbitrary um, mathematical spaces. And those arbitrary mathematical spaces are just some abstract space. But you want to think about them just like three-dimensional real space. And I said, I take my fields and I put my fields into representations of those um, <coughs> or those mathematical spaces, which is exactly the same as we do in three dimensions. In three dimensions, I say, in classical mechanics, I said I have three degrees of freedom, and I put those three degrees of freedom into a vector of a thing, and I call them the x, the y, and the z component of my particle. And now, the position of a particle is generalized into fields. And then I take many, many fields and put those fields into a vector of some representations, of some space. So if I have a five dimensional real space, I take five fields, and I put those five fields into a vector inside this five-dimensional uh, five space. Is that clear? It's just the generalization of positions in three-dimensional space. Now I use fields instead of positions, and it's not three dimension; it's some other space. OK? <coughs> and what we really care about in terms of when we do physics, in particular physics, usually we care about SON. SON are rotation in n-dimensional real space. SUN, which is rotation in n-dimensional complex space, and U1, which is rotation in one-dimension complex space or two-dimensional real space. They are equivalent. So let me talk a little bit about all of those. And <clears throat> let's talk about how we actually do, a <clears throat> how we actually generate singlets in general, OK? So <clears throat> we know how to do this in, in three-dimensional real space. You just take the two vectors and dot product them. We also know how to do it in, uh, in spins. So when you learn to, to combine spins, you remember you take spins half and spin halves and put them together, and you get, what do you get from half and half? Zero and one, right? So I can, there's actually a way to combine the two spins half in order to generate a spin zero. And a spin zero is the singlet, it's the thing that doesn't so we already know how to do it with vector in three-dimensional real space. We know how to do it with spin half. And we know how to do it in, and there's actually a generalization. And since these are very important for the standard model, I want to work on them one, one by one, OK? So the first example I'm going to use is the U1. And U1 is nothing but complex number. So when I talk about U1 symmetry, it sounds very kind of, uh, I don't know, fancy. I have a U1 symmetry. U1 symmetry is nothing but playing with complex number. And complex number, by now, I hope everybody is very familiar with. You don't feel they are weird anymore. So how do I use U1? All I need is the following thing. I'm telling you that I have a complex number. <coughs> Say x is a complex number. And I assign to this x some number q. q is a real number. And now I say, I take my number x. I take all my numbers in my theory. And I rotate all of, the, of my numbers by some angle theta, OK? And I rotate them in the angle theta such that for each, each variable, I multiply it by some number q. Is that clear? So for example, if this theta is 10 degree and this q is 2, then x rotate by 20 degree, OK? Just a complex number that I rotate the phase of the complex number, OK? So let's take the following example. Let's say that I have three complex numbers, x, y, and z. And q of, of x is 1, q of y is 2, and q of z is 3. OK? And I ask, how do I get invariance? So for example, <clears throat> x, x star and y, y star is an invariant because x, x star is an invariant because x star transforms with a minus compared to x. And 
I hope you see that x square y is also an invariant. Why x, x, star, x square y is an invariant? Because x transform with theta, x squared transform with 2 theta, and y transform also with 2 theta, and y star transform with minus 2 theta. Brrr, that was too long. Okay, so let me write it, let me write it. Okay. <coughs> so I want to explain why, <coughs> why x per y star is invariant under this rotation. So let's write it. So x, x go to e to the, e to the i theta x, and y go to e to the 2 i theta y. So then what, what happened to x squared? So x squared go to e to the 2 i theta x squared, because I have it twice. And what's happened to y star? Since it's a star, y star go to e to the minus 2 i theta y star, OK, because it's a star. And then x squared times y, then this exactly cancel this, and this is an invariant. OK? You OK with this, that we understand how to build invariants? <coughs> OK. So <coughs> these are some more invariants that you can actually write. And I hope that you can convince yourself that those are the other invariants that we can build. So the whole story of building invariants from complex numbers become a very easy task. The easy task is as following. All we need to do is just make sure that the sum of these Qs is, is zero. When I have, for each, for each number x, I have a, a number Q. For, for a star, the number becomes minus Q, and you see that the sum is zero. So here it's 1 minus 1 plus 2 minus 2. Here is 1 plus 1, it's 2 minus 2. Here it's 1 plus 2 minus 3. Here it's 3 minus 3, and here it's <coughs> 4 minus 1 minus 3, which is also zero, OK? Any question on this? Ah, I lost you. It become late, and I was, but hopefully we, you know, we will do more example, and hopefully it will be clear. <clears throat> so <coughs> let's move on. So that was U1. So U1, I was telling you how we actually built invariants in U1. We just combined the numbers. How we go from SU2? So SU2 is basically just the algebra that we learn and the all the things that we learned when we did spin. And I assume you all did adding and, and, subtra and uh, combining spins in quantum mechanics. And basically, the same story going for general things when we do SU2, OK? And the idea is as following, is that you actually, anything that is living SU2, we call it spin, OK? When I have a, something that has two degrees of freedom in SU2, we say that's a doublet of SU2. And the way we think about it is like a spin half. What is a spin half? A spin half is a particle that has two degrees of freedom, a spin up and a spin down. And of course, when I rotate in real space, these two components kind of change, right? In one, if I, if I have my spin up in the z direction and I measure in the x direction, I have 50 chance, uh, half and half probability to get in this direction and in this direction. So it's depend on the orientation that I have, OK? So we know how to combine spins. We combine, for example, half and half. I can get a, <clears throat> I can get a zero. So now I'm asking you the following question: How can I get a zero if I have spins half and spins three halves? How can I get a spin zero from half and three halves? So two halves can give me zero. How can I get a zero from a three half and halves? Lost you completely. <coughs> so let me kind of break down and, and discuss how we do, um, how we combine spins in quantum mechanics, and then we will be able to see how we do a general thing in SU2, how we generate invariant in SU2. So the way we combine spin is as following. So if I have two spins, some S1 and S2, S1 times S2, I know that I combine them, and I combine them from S1 minus S2, and let's assume that S1 is bigger or equal to S2. It's up from S1 minus S2, S1 minus S2 plus 1, S1 minus S2 plus 2, all the way up to S1 plus S2. That brings a bell, I, I hope. That should be something that I was assuming you know. That's something that we learn in quantum mechanics. Yes? That's how we actually combine spins. When we combine spins, when you make a product of two spins, then we have all those kind of things. 
I still lost you. So, you remember this? Yes, you all remember this, yes? So why it looks like I totally lost you, okay? So, <coughs> that's how we actually know how to combine spins, right? And now I'm asking you the following question. How do I get a spin zero if I keep combining? So I, can, I take this and I can keep combining. So now I say if I have a spin half and a spin three halves, how can I make this something that makes them as into a singlet? So I want both of them to be there. So for example, I can take three half squared, three half times three half, I can make a singlet, yes? And if I take half times half, I can also make a singlet. And Someone come with another less trivial example. So I can take three half, yes? Three. Thank you very much. So I can take this. Uh, this one also give me a singlet, right? Half cubed times three half also give me a singlet. Okay? So in SU2, in order to get a singlet, all we need to do is just keep adding them up using spin adding such that at the end, I could get a singlet. And when I get a singlet, that's the thing that is invariant under rotation. So I already know how to do it in, in U1, and I know how to do it in SU2. And for the very last thing for today, I just want to do it in SU3. And I'm not going to tell you too much about SU3. All I'm just telling you is that in SU3, it's very similar to SU2. It's just a little bit more abstract. And I put my thing into the equivalent of spin half in SU3 is something that we call a triplet. There are three degrees of freedom. And when I take two degrees of freedom and I combine them, I can create a singlet, and there's something called a three and a three bar, and I can create a singlet. If you never heard about it, it's okay. It will be a little bit too much for me to get into the details into here. All I want to say is the following, that we know that the strong interaction is an SU3 group, and we know that there's no free quarks, okay? There's the st there are statement there's no free quarks. And the general statement that there's no free quarks basically tell us that I cannot have anything that I see that is not a singlet under this SU3. And I'm not going to discuss why it is. But therefore, when I actually see particles that are charged under the strong interaction, like bions and mesons, they must be singlet under SU3. And in order to build those singlets, I need to combine those spin of SU3. And how I combine spin of SU3, I use this kind of um, <coughs> In the three, three times three times three is one, and three times three bar is also one. And it doesn't really matter what are these two details, but a three is a quark. A quark is transformed as a three. And if I take three quarks, I can make a, something that is singlet. And when I take three quarks, how do I call them? I call them a baryon. When I take a quark and an antiquark, that's three times three bar, then I call a meson, okay? So is this the group theory be, be beyond our understanding of, um, of, of the spectrum of QCD is the fact that a baryon is actually made out of three, 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 and there are three quarks, and a meson made out of three and a three bar. <coughs> so I want to, before we ending, I want to do a little game, and I call it the building invariant games. And it's going to be important when we move to the standard model, but it's not the standard model. So those of you who think, ah, it's a standard model, I know the answer, it's not. You have to think a little bit more. And the game is as following. I have my symmetry, which is SU3 cos SU2 cos U1, which is the symmetry of the standard model. And I want to build invariant. So for the U1, we have to make sure that the number add up to zero. For the SU2, we just do a spin. And for SU3, all we need to remember is this kind of thing. When I have a, part, a, a field that I have a bar on it, it's become a bar. That's it. And the fields are Q, 3, 2, 1, U, D, and H. It looks familiar because it looks like the standard model, but it's not. Everything is there are scalars. And I wrote some invariants here. And I want, to ask the, I want to ask you, and I'll be quiet for the usual thing for one minute. And I want to ask you which of those things are invariant under this symmetry and which is not, okay? So the question is that I give you these five things and I want you to tell me if these are invariant under this symmetry or not. So please ask me question because I think I lost you a little bit on this last part. But if not, you know, talk to you, you people around you or ask me a question 
and I want to each of those five tell me is it invariant or not. Okay? Good. Please go start talking. Yes? And ask me a question if you don't understand what I'm talking about. Oh, I, one thing, I, I, I should have explained one thing I didn't explain. So when I tell you these are the fields, this is the, how the field transform under SU3. This is how the field transform under SU2. And this is the charge under the U1. So of course, all of you saw the standard model are familiar. But if you've never seen it, I want to explain. This is the U1 charge, this is the SU2, and this is the SU3. OK? Sorry. OK, keep going. Tell me when you have it. You have it? All of you? <clears throat> Please try to do it. Try to kind of combine the SU3, combine the SU2. Okay. <clears throat> so let's start and let's see what we are having. <clears throat> so is this one, is it invariant or not? <laughs> so this thing is trivial. Whenever you have a, a field and the complex conjugate of the field is always invariant. Because if something with the complex conjugate, it is always invariant. So that's obviously an invariant. We don't have to worry too much. What about H cube? What about H cube? No. OK. Can you tell me why? Is it invariant under SU3? It's invariant under SU3 because it's just a thing. Is it invariant under SU2? No, because three, three doublets. Three spins half cannot make a spin zero. Is it in the invariant under the U1? No. <laughs> Actually, it works very well, this game, so far. OK. UDD. UDD. Yes? No. Ah, OK. We're already in the quantum regime. OK. So let's try and see what's happened for the SU3. So actually, let's try, because the SU3 is a little, it's a little uh, thing. What's happened to the U1? What's happened in the U1? The U1 is 4 minus 2 minus 2 is 0. That's good. What happened for the SU2? Invariant. What's happened for the SU3? Invariant? Why not? So it's 3 times 3 times 3. So it's 3 times 3 times 3. And 3 times 3 times 3 is, is invariant, right? Yes. OK, there's actually a subtlety here. And I want to tell you this subtlety. Anybody know what the subtlety here? OK, I'm just telling you, actually, this one is totally anti-symmetric. And therefore, if I have two fields that are the same, this one vanishes. So assuming that actually these do these have another index, then it will be allowed. So I, the subtlety that I should have think about. OK, good. QUD, invariant. No? What kills it? SU2 and U1. Very nice. HQU star. Invariant? Yes? Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. I'm happy. 
I was unhappy 10 minutes ago, but actually I, you know, I'm very happy because you all got it. So for the homework, and that's the last thing we are doing today, I will ask you to find more invariants, and actually I, I really ask you to find all the invariants to get up to dimension four. All the invariants that build out of three or four of those fields. So that's end my second lecture, and let me just kind of summarize what we did today. So what we did today, we were actually talking about Feynman diagrams, and we understand how we do Feynman diagrams, and it is just generalization of second order perturbation theory. And then we start talking about symmetries, and we understand, and it looks like at least most of you totally understand how to build invariants. And what we're going to do tomorrow, and tomorrow I have actually two lectures, so I hope that we survive it. And the two lectures, we first going to keep going a little bit more on, on symmetries, and then we finally, tomorrow is going to be the biggest day of our life, and we're going to write the standard model down. Okay? So now we have a break, and as usual, please, please come ask me question as usual. Okay. If, thank you very much. Any more questions Before now? Before the no. break, any question? I didn't think about it. I want to ask you, because you say that uh, we assume the symmetries, but I was thinking if uh, those symmetries can be accidental, and maybe we have to build the Lagrangians with another symmetries that are more fundamental. Yeah, so, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question is, so in this, the assumption that I'm making is that I impose the symmetry. So the, 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 the rules of the game is the democratic principle. I impose the symmetry, this is the rule, and <coughs> then I ask, is other invariant or not? And tomorrow we are going to talk about accidental symmetries, and I'm going to actually make some distinguish between imposed symmetry and accidental symmetry. Okay? But at this level, I'm just imposing those symmetries. One more question there. <coughs> what about the discrete symmetries? So in principle, I could have done it, but you remember the way, the, the rule of the game was that I decide what symmetry to impose, so I decide not to impose them. But it's my total decision, and if you build your own model, you decide to put them, that's totally fine. Just for now, I decide not to put them, and it's not only me, it's the standard model decide not to put them. So we are not actually use them, but it's in the, in the rule of the game, you're totally allowed to use them. Okay. Okay, no more questions. Thank you very much, Yuval.